Top Most Damaging Moments That Destroyed Defendants' Cases in Court Many of our trial watchers wait for those of uh oh or aha moments in court you know. When something happens that is absolutely devastating to a defendant's case, it's kind of like in the movies, right? When they have a defendant who says something, they're caught off guard, or someone admits something on the stand, and the whole case blows up. You remember, you can't handle the truth from a few good men, or the shower confession in Legally Blonde. I don't care what anyone says, that's actually a good movie. Anyway, many times we just don't get that in real life, because real life is not like television. That makes sense. But sometimes, sometimes we get those moments in real life, and I will tell you, they are something to see. So here are the top admissions in the past year that seemingly destroyed a defendant's case. Number 3. Trevor Summers This was a very disturbing case out of Florida. Summers was accused of sneaking into the home of his estranged wife, Elisa, namely manipulating his children to let him in. Trevor and Elisa were separated. They were in the process of divorcing. In fact, Elisa took out an injunction against him, and he was charged in connection with tying her up, sexually assaulting her, and then kidnapping her. So at one point in his trial, Summers decided to let go of his attorney and wanted to represent himself, which is his constitutional right to do. Now listen to what she had to say. I'm asking you specifically, before we had sex, did I threaten you or force you to have sex? My answer is yes. You forced me to have sex with you. Did I hold you down? No. Did I push you? Not at that time of having sex. But prior to having sex, you did push me. You did hold me down. You did tie me up. You did attack me. And you did break into my home when I was sleeping. You raped me. So you're calling it rape. It is. That is the definition of rape to come into someone's home and attack them, tie them up, and then have sex with them. That is the definition of rape. Did you know I was coming to your house? No. No, he placed the pillow over my face with such force until I lost consciousness and had thoughts that I was going to meet Jesus, and this was my last breath. So yeah, that's pretty bad for him. It's not just some random eyewitness. This is the surviving victim testifying directly against the defendant about what she says happened to her at his hands. And you know what? The jury believed her because they convicted Summers on all 11 counts, including attempted murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison. Number 2. Daryl Brooks Up next, let's focus a little bit more on some eyewitnesses, and we can't talk about eyewitnesses without getting into the Daryl Brooks Jr. trial. You see, Daryl Brooks was charged in connection with driving a red Ford SUV into a group of holiday attendees during the Waukesha Christmas Parade in 2021. This happened down in Wisconsin, and it ultimately resulted in the deaths of six people and injuries to dozens of others. And for anyone who watched this trial on the Long Cry Network or followed it here on Sidebar, you know that it was pretty wild. It was pretty wild because the defendant represented himself, and when defendants represent themselves, kind of like we saw with Mr. Summers, sometimes they think they know the case better than their attorneys. They think that they can do a better job than their attorneys. And Brooks, he raised a number of different defenses. One was that there was a possible mechanical failure with the car, that whoever was driving didn't do this intentionally because the driver was honking, and of course, that he didn't do it. The most devastating moment for Mr. Brooks is when you had eyewitnesses positively identify him as the driver. But did you see anybody, like, actually fly or roll or tumble? Yeah, so originally it was, we, I heard sounds like thuds, and then it was in the air, like bowling pins. Okay, did you get a look at the driver of the vehicle as it went through the parade? Yeah. Mom, when I had just said it veered to the left and then struck the group of people, it was probably about six or seven feet from where I was standing. Okay, and I saw directly through the driver's window. What did you see? I saw a man focused on the group ahead of him. Is that Daryl Brooks that you saw? Yes. And as soon as that happened, about 10 seconds after, I froze and I said to my mom, who was with me, I just saw that guy at the gas station, and it clicked that it was the same person. You remember exactly that was the same person? Yes. You say that the vehicle was coming right at you. Were you able to see inside the vehicle? I was. How many people were inside that vehicle? I could only see one person in the vehicle, presumably. Yes. It was on the driver's side, front driver's side. Could you tell? Yes. It was a black male. And at the time, the eyes is what drew me in were completely wide open. And um, 
you made eye contact with the individual driving the vehicle. So you looked eye to eye with the person who hit your daughter. I did. Do you see him in the courtroom today? I do. Can you point him out by where he's seated and what he's wearing? Take off his face mask. Thank you. He is seated at the table located over here. He's got a gray suit on, a blue shirt, and a tie. The record reflect that witness has identified the defendant Daryl Brooks. Objection I do not consent to being called that name, nor do I know any individual by that name. You're on record. Will reflect that the witness has identified the defendant as the driver of the SUV that struck his daughter. May my objection be noted for the record as well, your honor. Fighting all of the sovereign citizen rhetoric, where Brooks seemingly didn't consent to his name and the government having authority over him, it didn't work. To have eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses to a crime and point out the defendant, that is huge. That is a prosecutor's dream. And it worked. The jury convicted Brooks of all 76 charges, including six counts of first-degree intentional homicide, and he was sentenced to multiple consecutive life terms of imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Number 1. Let's move on to defendants taking the stand because sometimes when defendants take the stand, it ensues to their benefit. They're able to tell their side of the story. They were able to explain why they did what they did or maybe they didn't do something. Usually, taking the stand has a benefit in self-defense cases and also police-involved shootings because we want to understand why someone felt the need to pull the trigger. And that was the case in the Aaron Dean trial. Aaron Dean is a former Fort Worth, Texas police officer who shot and killed a woman named Atashana Jefferson at her mother's home. This happened when Dean and his partner were responding to a call about an open door at the home. Now, at the time, Jefferson was just babysitting her eight-year-old nephew and playing video games with him. According to prosecutors, Dean never announced his presence. He never said he was an officer. He didn't knock. Instead, he was shining his flashlight. And that's when Jefferson looked through a bedroom window while holding a gun that she had a license for. And Dean said, show me your hands, put up your hands. And that is when Dean shot and killed Jefferson. He was charged with murder, but he argued that he was acting in self-defense and he was justified. You did have all the information you needed at that point. Just tell the jury, just tell them. He didn't do a good job. Would you give yourself an A plus for that minute 17 seconds? There's probably things I could have done better. What grade would you give yourself? A to F. I'd like to see how you know. Go ahead, tell us. I'm talking before you pull the trigger. That minute 17 seconds before you pull the trigger. A to F. Probably a B. Oh, B, a passing grade. What do you think you did the best? Not sure. You gave yourself a B, and you can't tell this jury what you did the best in those minutes and 17 seconds? No, I'm not sure. You want to change your grade, maybe? No. So you're happy with every decision you made up until that moment you pulled the trigger about investigating this open structure. Sure, there were things we could have done better. You're telling this jury you're happy with every decision you made from when you first turned that body cam on to the minute and 17 second mark. Based on what I knew at the time, yes. Oh, checking that house, checking that perimeter. You're giving yourself a B. Yes. He shoots and kills an innocent woman in front of her young nephew and grades himself a B. And then he can't even answer why that's the case. He can't even answer what he did right. Seems pretty confident in his actions, but he was ultimately convicted. But he wasn't convicted of murder. He was convicted of the lesser charge of manslaughter. In other words, the jury felt that he acted recklessly, not intentionally, and he was ultimately sentenced to over 11 years in prison. Did you like it? Tell us what you think of the video in the comment section below, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more interesting videos.